Uh, we worship you, Lord. We worship you because you have given us your spirit to worship you. And so, Lord, we this morning come and bow before you and ask that in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would enlarge our lives, encourage our hearts, and Lord, use us for your kingdom. And so we thank you at this Pentecost Sunday in Jesus' name. Amen. From 1976, for about 13 years, our family lived in a city called Aomori. Uh, this is a city of population the same size as Christchurch, uh, about 300,000 people at the time. And this city in northern Japan was famous for four things. First of all, a very difficult dialect, Japanese dialect, called Tsungaruben. Uh, let me tell you a little story that's illustrated by what you see on the screen here. In World War II, an American soldier uh, visited a farm, a chicken farm, in the city of Aomori. And the farmer thought that the soldier had come to steal his chickens, and to eat his chickens. And the farmer couldn't speak English. But in the local dialect, he called out, no, no, don't, don't, don't take my chickens. And that local dialect um, is there on the screen in the middle there, and it's, my net, is what you would say. It sounded like, to the American soldier, my hen. And the American soldier thought, ah, the farmer is telling me this is his chicken, so I'm not to steal it. So the soldier didn't take those precious chickens, and uh, nothing happened. And, but the words were not really understood. But the message was clear. The message was clear. He got the wrong understanding but, and didn't take the chickens, but he didn't understand the Japanese. The normal word for um, no, don't do it in Japanese is dame, not my hair. Completely different sounding word, but the soldier thought he's saying my hen, so didn't take it. The other thing that the city is very famous for is snow. We get seven meters of snow in the winter, so these windows would all be covered with snow. It's also the city where they have the most delicious apples in uh, Japan, and some people would say the most delicious apples in the world. It's also a city where they have an annual festival. It's called the Nebuta Festival. It's beginning in July of each year, the drums would start to beat at the end of our street. And all year, teams of men would be making these very large floats that will be paraded through the city every night during the first week of August. For one week in summer, the city was just crowded with over a million people. And the most widely known explanation of this festival originated from the flutes and drums that the Japanese shogun used to, uh, in a battle which happened in an area called Mutsu, which is near where we were. It's very much like the Trojan horse story, the story where the, uh, they made a large replica and they jumped out, and this is a Japanese version of it. And so we celebrated this festival. Do you know that over 2,000 years ago, there was another festival, and it was known by the Jews as the Feast of Weeks. This festival came 50 days after the festival of the Passover. Jesus Christ was crucified at Passover time, as we know. The Feast of Weeks is the second of three solemn feasts that all Jewish males were required to travel to Jerusalem to attend. 
And at Festival of Weeks, something very special happened that changed the world forever. And today, we celebrate that event as Pentecost. Pentecost means 50. It was the day the Church of God was birthed by the Holy Spirit. Also, the day the message of salvation through Jesus Christ was first preached to a crowd of people from at least 16 plus nations and people groups around the world. And that day, there was no problem with translation. Everybody understood what they were hearing. In Acts chapter 2, we read this, When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own language being spoken by the believers. And they were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own language. Let's have a Pentecost moment, shall we? I want you to stand up and I want you to praise God in your own language to somebody else. So if you speak Chinese, find a Chinese person and tell them how wonderful God is. If you speak English, find an English-speaking person and tell them how good God is. If you speak Japanese, do the same. Thai, the same. Whatever language is your language, stand up, find somebody with that language and tell them something wonderful about God. Okay, go. Okay, thank you very much. Can you just imagine what happened on Pentecost Day? The whole city, the people of Jerusalem heard the gospel, heard the wonder of God being spoken in their own languages and all the languages that were there. It was a fulfillment of a prophecy found in Joel chapter 2. In many times, Jesus had told his disciples that this would happen. It was the divine coming by God that, would, that he would be with us to the end of the age. Remember Jesus said, I will be with you to the end of the age. How? By the Holy Spirit. The coming of the Holy Spirit would mean that people would be convicted of sin and unbelief. I remember in our church uh, in Japan, uh, a lady became a Christian after studying the Bible for many, many years. Three years, I think, she did Bible study before she became a Christian. And three months after she became a Christian, she came to us one day and she said, I'm gonna, I can't be a Christian. I'm going to give up being a Christian. And we were very surprised because we'd rejoiced so much in her salvation and her baptism. And we said, why? She said, before I became a Christian, I used to tell lies all the time and it was no problem at all. But now I'm a Christian, even the littlest untruth, it really hurts. And we were able to rejoice with her and say, that is because the Holy Spirit of God is convicting you of your sin and your need, and he is working in your life. Praise God for that. And she went on to become a strong Christian and a stronger Christian in our church and in our work today. The Holy Spirit's work is partly there. The Holy Spirit was come to bring truth and each one of you who believed in Jesus Christ was born again and became a child of God and is led by the Holy Spirit. There's so many things. This is just a few of the things that are related to the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. But from the Bible, we learn much, much more about the Holy Spirit. However, just like water, 
You can study about it and study about it, but until you drink it, you really don't know it. You can, be, you can study about, the, about water and have a PhD in the study of water, but if you don't drink water, you won't really understand it. Now, head knowledge must be heart knowledge, heart experience. Otherwise, we have no real knowledge of the Holy Spirit. Our heart experience must begin with a thirst for God and his truth. We just sang, as the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants after my God. How desperate are you for a touch from God today? The Bible teaches that God is spirit and that God is love. If this is so, then I should be able to know God in my understanding and feel God in my spirit. I can't see God, but I should be able to experience his presence. If the coming of the Holy Spirit changed the lives of the disciples and has continued to change lives to this day, what exactly is it that happens? How does God do this? What power is it that so impacts a life that the person is never the same again? What is it that God did that meant that from a few weak, uneducated disciples, the largest gathering of people called the church was birthed? What power was it that enabled this miracle to happen? From John's Gospel, we get a little glimpse of the answer. John 14, verse 23 says, All who love me will do what I say, and my Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with them all. And again, in John 15, verse 9, I have loved you, even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. Do we understand what Jesus was saying here? Jesus said that the love of his heavenly Father had for him would be in you and I. Pentecost was the outpouring of the Father's love for Jesus by the Spirit into the weak hearts and to the hearts of you people like you and I. Do we really, have we really grasped that? Here is the Father pouring his love into his Son. His Son pouring his love into his disciples. And how? By the Holy Spirit. The love that you feel in your hearts is God's love. By the Holy Spirit. In Joel 2, it's quoted by Peter in the first sermon after Pentecost where he says, In those days I will pour out my spirit. Like wind and fire, water was a symbol of the Holy Spirit used in the Bible. In Romans chapter 5, which we read earlier, Verse 5 says this, For God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. When does God pour his love into your heart? Well, the first answer is when you confessed your sin, and need of Jesus, and accept Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. At that moment, the Holy Spirit of God came into your heart as a gift, and you were born again and received the gift of the Holy Spirit. But there's a second answer. The second answer is that according to Romans 5 verse 3, it happens when we run into problems and trials. I sure need God's love when that happens, don't you? 
For the early Christians, trials came mostly because they were Christians and they witnessed to their newfound faith. The Bible says, we know how dearly God loves us. And according to Romans 3, verse, part of verse 3 and verse 5, it's a process that happens in our lives. First step is that we rejoice when things go wrong. Ooh, <laughs> that's a hard one. But the Bible says that if you rejoice in God when things go wrong, then the process will start. Because we know that trials develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And this character strengthens our confidence in the hope of salvation. And this hope we have will not disappoint us. We will never be disappointed. Why? Because we know how dearly God loves us. How do we know? How do you and I know that God so dearly loves us? The answer? He's given us his Holy Spirit. That's how we know. So how does this happen exactly in practice, in daily life? How does this happen? Some of you may know the story of Corrie Teen Boone. Let me tell those of you, uh, this is a new story for some. In 1947, Corrie Teen Boone was speaking in a church in Munich when she saw a man who was a guard in the Nazi concentration camp uh, that she and her sister had suffered in. Corrie Teen Boone was about to speak about forgiveness and love and when she saw this man, she remembered being paraded naked in front of him. And she remembered that her sister had died in the concentration camp. And the man came up to her and said, you mentioned Raven's book in your talk. That's the name of the camp. I was a guard there. But since that time, I have become a Christian. I know God has forgiven me for cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear from your lips as well. And his hand came towards me. Will you forgive me? He asked. Corrie Teen Boone said, I couldn't have been there many seconds that he stood there, his hand held out, but to me, it seemed like ours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. And still I stood there with coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Love and forgiveness are acts of the will and the will can function regardless of te the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me! I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. God, you provide the feeling. And as I put my hand, an incredible thing took place. A current started from my shoulder and raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands and the former guard and the former prisoner and I had never, ever known the intensity of God's love as I did then. Pentecost 
was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And when we believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in our lives. God is love, and that love is poured out into our hearts. But to experience that love in a greater way, we often need to consciously decide to love and to forgive. It's then that we experience a fresh understanding of the God's love in our lives because the Spirit indwells all who believe in Him and we should be able to feel that love and exercise that love in a way that changes the world. We love because God first loved us. This is a fact that we base our lives on. The Holy Spirit is a channel of God's love and we put it into practice by loving and forgiving as Jesus Christ did. The fact is that God has given all Christians his love by the Holy Spirit. Our role is to exercise that love towards other people and in doing so, trust God to continue to pour his love into our hearts. I know that there are some of you in this congregation who have experienced the real peace and joy of forgiving family members and others who have done you wrong. Making the hard choice to forgive. But if you know somebody that you need to forgive, you need to extend God's love to, please do it today. You'll be freed by that action to enjoy the outpouring of God's love in your heart. When we realize how great God's love is, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. He reveals it to us. He even goes so far as to pour it into our hearts. Love is not something that God rations out. He doesn't guard the amount that he pours out into our heart. He keeps on pouring it. He rains it down like buckets of water. The more, the more we can hold. God is wildly generous with his love. When the rain pours down, we know it. We hear it. We feel it. The same thing goes for God's love. He has made it easy for us to understand. It's not difficult to miss it. If we seek God, we will find him. In times of trial and weakness, we are challenged to forgive and love as we should. It is then that our lives are flooded with the love of God and the feeling and the experience of that is so wonderful that we want to praise God. My personal experience is that when I had a fresh understanding of the love of God in this way, my life was never the same again. And when God touched my life with a touch of his Holy Spirit, understanding his love in my life, I, my, emo my emotions were touched, I wept. The result was a new power to live and witness as I should. It was a time when I was spiritually dry and desperately needing God's help. And that night some friends prayed for me. And early the next morning, the Holy Spirit woke me up with a tremendous understanding and feeling of the power and the love of God to the point where I was glad no one else was in the room as I just burst out in tears because I just had never experienced the love of God like that in my life since I'd become a Christian 30 years before. For the disciples of Jesus... Love was a commitment to follow and obey. And Jesus' commitment to you is to pour his love into your life so you can follow and obey him. It is by God's love that I love. There is nothing of myself apart from an exercise of my will to love and forgive, to rejoice and trust God in times of trial. Zechariah 4, verse 6 in the Old Testament says, It is not by force, not by human strength, not, but by my spirit, says the Lord. How did Pentecost change our world? How does the Pentecost change your life? How does the Holy Spirit change your life? It happens 
when you have your own personal Pentecost and God pours his love into your hearts by the Holy Spirit. When that happens, you will never be the same again. Don't try to work it out. Just trust and step out in faith in whatever area of life you need to. Are you having a difficult time? Trust the Holy Spirit. Rejoice and say thank you. Ask God for a fresh experience of his spirit. Are you feeling spiritually dry this morning? Are you thirsty for God? Ask God for his Holy Spirit to be poured into your heart. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Will it be a fresh Pentecost for you? I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to come and to touch our lives this morning. And I'm just going to do that by saying it's a simple word of come Holy Spirit. And then I'm going to put up a, a, a song on the screen that I want us to look at and read through in your, as you read it through. And as you read it through, if that is your desire, open your heart and say, Holy Spirit, I want to experience your love today in a fresh way. Let's invite God. We cannot see God, but by his spirit, he wants to pour his love into our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit. Come. Touch our lives. Come, Holy Spirit. And together let's read this prayer, this song. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Father, this Pentecost morning, this is our desire. We want to know you more, more power, more love, more of you in our lives. Lord, we come in weakness. Some of us come in trial and difficulty. But Lord, we thank you that your spirit is poured into our hearts. So Lord, for those who are dry, those who long for more of your love, pour out your spirit into their hearts by faith today. Move our hearts and use us to tell others about Jesus, we pray. In the wonderful, mighty, powerful name of Jesus, we pray.